Hello, everyone. I'm Caroline Bushnell, the Senior Vice President of Corporate Engagement at the Good Food Institute. And I'm excited you to welcome you to this webinar where we'll explore how alternative protein companies may be able to access financing through the Department of Energy. So thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about the Good Food Institute, or GFI, for those of you not yet familiar with us. GFI is a 501c3 nonprofit organization focused on advancing alternative protein science and research, advocating for public investment in alternative proteins and a level playing field, and empowering partners across the food system, including many of you joining us today, to create a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. In addition to the US, GFI has affiliate offices in the most critical economies and regions for alternative protein advancement, including Europe, Asia Pacific, India, Israel, and Brazil. So today, we'll introduce you to a program that has the potential to help companies involved in alternative proteins unlock the critical funding that they need to scale their manufacturing. And this opportunity is timely. The fundraising environment has been challenging over the past year, not just for alternative protein companies, but for private companies across sectors. And it's also true that venture capital financing can be less than ideal to fund manufacturing scale up, which is a near term goal of an increasing number of companies involved in alternative proteins. The Department of Energy Loan Program Office's Title 17 Clean Energy Financing Program may be able to help bridge that gap, providing loan guarantees for innovative manufacturing facility projects based in the U.S. that support clean energy deployment and industrial decarbonization. And while this program is most appropriate for more mature companies, both those specializing in alternative proteins and major food and meat companies with alternative protein product lines, it's never too early for companies to learn about the program and set themselves up for future success. So as for the flow of this webinar, first, we are honored to be joined by Congresswoman Julia Brownlee, a champion of alternative proteins as a solution to build a sustainable and secure protein supply, create high quality jobs for Americans, and position the U.S. as a leader in the industry. She will provide introductory remarks in just one minute. From there, we'll hand it over to the Department of Energy for brief remarks from Director of the Department of Energy Loan Program Office, Jigger Shaw, and a presentation by Adam Lowry, Senior Consultant and Contractor for the DOE Loan Program Office. We are so grateful to them for sharing their time and expertise with all of us today. And finally, we will leave plenty of time at the end for your questions. So please feel free to enter those in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen throughout the present presentation. Uh, we will be tracking them there. And for reference, this webinar will be recorded and shared with all of the participants and also posted on GFI's YouTube channel. So with all of that, I am thrilled to turn it over to Congresswoman Brownlee. Well, thank you, Caroline, very, very much. And I'd like to thank the Good Food Institute and the Department of Energy for putting this event together and to everyone who has joined us uh, this afternoon. Through my work on the Select Committee on the Climate uh, 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 Congress, excuse me, my work on the Select Committee on the Climate during the last two years of Congress, I became keenly interested in the intersection of diet and climate and the immense opportunities we have to innovate, to develop new industries, and to create new jobs while reducing the climate impact of the food we eat. I'm also keenly aware, as I know all of you are, that global hunger and food insecurity are big challenges your industry stands to impact in a very powerful way. Clearly, the DOE and the Biden administration understand the potential impact. And while Congress can move a little more slowly than I'd like, I can assure you that my colleagues are starting to take notice. DOE's loan program office is going to talk to you about the tremendous opportunities they can make available to help you scale up, but I know what is available is still not enough. If we want the United States to be the leader in the development of alternative proteins, we'll need 
even more investment. And that's why I recently introduced the Protein Act that if passed would allocate $250 million to establish, to establish excuse me, research centers of excellence at universities focused on alternative pro proteins elevate their focus in federal research programs and foster workforce development and manufacturing capabilities for alternative proteins. So let me just say once again, I wanna thank the Good Food Institute for helping to organize this event. And I'd like to also thank the Department of Energy and the Biden administration for understanding the tremendous potential the alternative protein industry has to create new climate-friendly innovative businesses whose positive impact will be felt for generations to come. Thank you so much. And thank you, Carolyn, for the opportunity. Thank you, Congresswoman Brownlee, for those energizing remarks. Uh, and now we will turn it over to a video from Director Shaw. I'm Junior Shaw, the Director of the Loan Programs Office here at the Department of Energy. Thank you for allowing me to join you and say hello ahead of this informative and interactive webinar. And thanks to Congresswoman Brownlee, as well as the Good Food Institute for their leadership in the space. I know that our team is excited about the potential partnership with companies in the alternative protein sector. Historically, LPOs finance large-scale, innovative energy and advanced vehicle projects, where the private sector has been unwilling or unable to play a role. With the passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act, LPO has tens of billions of dollars of growth funding to support a wider array of technology related projects including innovative food and beverage supply chain projects. In May, we released updated Title 17 program guidance that incorporates changes and simplifies the application process. Today, we're here to talk specifically about the opportunity for alternative protein companies to apply under the 1703 program as an eligible industrial decarbonization technology. The U.S. industrial sector makes products and materials that Americans rely on with food and beverage production sitting near the top of that list. At LPO, we know that a decarbonized economy will require approaches that address the production emissions across every industrial process. There's no doubt that many of you here today are ready to engage with LPO, and I'm sure you have lots of questions. We look forward to getting into the details during today's webinar. These newly available resources delivered by key legislators like Congresswoman Brownlee are a game changer for large scale energy and infrastructure projects. And now the ball is in our court. Thanks for your interest. And I look forward to hearing from many of you as we work together to achieve President Biden's goal of net zero carbon emissions economy wide by 2050. All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Adam Lowry. Uh, I'm a consultant with the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office. And what I'm going to do today is uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, the programs uh, that your companies and your uh, infrastructure projects may qualify for uh, and give you a little bit of detail about uh, how to apply for those programs uh, if, you, if you would like. Um, just to give you uh, a little bit more context on uh, the role that I play at LPO, uh, I'm in our outreach and business development group, uh, which is really the front end of the funnel. We're the group that gets applicants and projects started at the loan programs office. And my role specifically is I manage a team of industry experts across the whole energy spectrum, from generation to all the way to storage and alternative fuels, including food and beverage. And uh, what I do is help clients get started uh, and then assign one of our application specialists when the time comes uh, to help companies that, like yourselves successfully apply for financing. I should also mention that I, uh, that I also have a background in the food business myself. Um, I've started uh, a company uh, in the food uh, business and built it to considerable scale. 
Um, and so familiar with some of the challenges uh, that you all are facing in terms of capital formation uh, and strategies for growth. So first, let me talk a little bit about the purpose of LPO and what we're trying to do. At LPO, we, we talk about trying to build a bridge to bankability. Uh, as you heard Director Shaw just say, what we're really focused on is providing project financing where traditional lenders are either unwilling or unable to provide uh, financing because the projects are deemed too risky. So what we look for is really things that are in between the stage where the technology has been proven and uh, where it is uh, fully available and commercially scaled. So we're looking to have a catalytic effect by taking proven technologies and scaling them to full market acceptance. Um, perhaps another way to kind of think about LPO is you wanna start thinking about us uh, when a lot of that technology risk has been retired, uh, but when you're thinking about that first commercial scale uh, deployment. To give you a sense of scale, uh, the LPO works at, uh, at very large scale. So we have 167 applications uh, that are active right now for close to $150 billion in financing. Uh, we, our average loan size is almost a billion dollars. And our smallest loans are right around $100 million. We'll talk about some of the reasons for that in a moment, uh, but that gives you sort of a sense of scale. And then we work absolutely all the way across the energy spectrum. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the areas here on the right that you can see that we do the most work in. And with some of our new mandates, uh, that's been expanded to include food and beverage activity, which I'll get into shortly. So when to think or what, you know, why work with, with LPO? Um, the, the value proposition is really three things. It's first and foremost, as I mentioned, access uh, to capital that's patient uh, that you may not otherwise have access to because it's in these riskier stages of development. It's also worth noting this is non-dilutive capital um, and in some uh, cases can be considerably less expensive than uh, other capital that might be available uh, for projects uh, such as these. Number two, the LPO is very flexible in terms of the way that we structure our loans uh, for projects. We work, as you saw across a wide spectrum, every project has uh, particular aspects to it that require uh, flexibility in the way that we structure the financing. And we are, uh, we're, we're very used to doing that. Uh, and then when you do get a loan from DOE, uh, you get a loan partner for the life of the project um, uh, with uh, a loan partner that also has a tremendous amount of expertise uh, in financial structuring, uh, portfolio management, and uh, the different technical areas uh, of the energy spectrum. Um, what my goal today is to help uh, all of you understand the general contours of our Title 17 uh, Innovative Clean Energy Program and how that relates to uh, food and beverage uh, related infrastructure projects. Uh, and really what I want you to be able to think about is how LPO could be a partner in your overall financing strategy as you start to develop these first commercial deployments. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, each of the four sub-programs uh, of the Title 17 Innovative Clean Energy Program listed here, but I'm going to spend uh, most times talking about our innovative supply chain, the second one here, which is the one that I think that'll be most relevant to uh, food and beverage companies. So first and foremost, all four Title 17 programs share the following eligibility requirements. Uh, it must be a project based in the United States. It must be an energy related project. We're gonna focus on that and I'm gonna show you exactly how food and beverage can be energy related in a second. It needs to achieve a significant greenhouse gas uh, reduction or savings. Uh, as with any loan, it has to have a reasonable prospect of repayment. The technology itself needs to be viable, meaning proven, and it needs to be commercially ready. Uh, the project needs to include a community benefits plan, and it can't uh, 
use any other form of prohibited federal support um, to qualify for an LPO loan. And then above in, uh, those, that are there are some category specific requirements for each of the four sub programs uh, that I'll briefly mention. So in order to qualify as a energy related project, a project needs to fit into one of these 13 categories. Now, when you look on this page, you'll see a lot of things that look like traditional energy projects. That is the uh, bread and butter of the LPO. But under some of the new uh, legislation that's, that's been passed uh, uh, by Congress and signed by the president, we have a new mandate at LPO around industrial decarbonization technologies. And this is where food and beverage companies, alternative protein companies can fit in. With our innovative energy projects, the first category, um, the project needs to include one of the 13 eligible technologies on the previous page and meet the innovation requirement, which states that it needs to be a new or significantly improved technology uh, that's been, as you can see here, recently uh, developed or discovered, uh, or in, uh, include a meaningful uh, improvement in the productivity or value. Uh, the recent changes are that this has been expanded uh, to include eligibility for food and beverage. Our innovative supply chain projects uh, category is the one where recently uh, here on the right side, you can see that in our most recent program guidance, it has been updated to, to say that LPO encourages applications uh, in the food and beverage sector that align with industrial decarbons the industrial decarbonization uh, roadmap and strategy of the DOE. So here again, same eligibility requirements uh, that were common to all of the projects. Uh, but this re relates to the manufacturing process itself. So if you're building a factory uh, or to the relevant product itself, uh, that innovation requirement of being new or significantly improved. And of course, uh, it has the same greenhouse gas uh, requirements. So I think this is the area under which most alternative protein companies would uh, likely apply for LPO financing. I'll very briefly mention two other programs just in case uh, you come across uh, this situation in developing your projects. One is called our State Energy Financing Institution Program. Uh, what this program does is, is quite simple. It basically says if you're able to get meaningful financial support from a state energy financing institution, so think a state green bank, uh, let's say you go to a state green bank and they say, yeah, we're going to support your infrastructure project, your new factory in our state, uh, then we can uh, amplify that investment uh, through our CEFI program. And it actually removes the innovation requirement uh, that the uh, first two programs that I shared have. So if you get uh, state support from a CEFI, uh, this is an option for you. And then the last program that we have is called our Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. Uh, this program also removes the innovation requirement, but does so for projects that redevelop, um, repurpose, repower, replace uh, old fossil fuel infrastructure. So in the event that you choose a site uh, that happened to be or is uh, a retiring fossil fuel um, in, uh, infrastructure site, uh, then you can go this path as well. Broadly speaking, uh, what we're doing here at, at LPO, of course, is, is lending across the entire uh, energy spectrum. And here included our, our tribal and automotive programs. Uh, we, we have teams of experts that work across every one of these technology area of interest, areas of interest, including food and beverage. And the way the process works is uh, once you get started and you want to start developing an application with LPO, uh, somebody from uh, our team in the outreach and business development world will actually start to work with you to actually develop your application uh, in collaboration so that you can be successful going through our program. 
some of the details of our program, I'll just uh, mention before I pause and, and we get into the uh, question and answer session. Uh, first of all, there, there is no minimum or maximum loan size, um, but I'm gonna mention some of our guidelines in the FAQs that come next. LPO can lend up to 80% of eligible project costs um, what one thing I would say is what's more typical based on the credit rating of the different projects that we see is more like a somewhere between a 50 and 70 percent debt to equity ratio. So, of course, project dependent, but something to think about as you're doing your equity capital formation for your new projects. Uh, we provide loan guarantees of up to 100% to uh, loans that come from the U.S. Treasury's Federal Financing Bank, or we can provide partial loan guarantees up to 90% from commercial lenders. Uh, they are typically structured as project financing, but as I mentioned before, uh, we can be quite flexible to accommodate other structures. Now, from a cost standpoint, this is probably the information that you're really looking for, which is what does an LPO loan cost? Uh, the interest rate for the loan is U.S. Treasuries plus three-eighths percent spread plus a risk-based charge. So the Treasury rate is fixed according to the tenor of the loan. We can go up to 30 years tenor on our loans. Most of them are 10 or 15. And so you'd either get a 10, 15 or 30 year uh, treasury rate plus three eighths. And then for uh, some projects, there is a risk based charge on top of that, uh, which is uh, relates to the credit rating of the project. It's almost always under uh, 100 basis points. Uh, and there's a schedule of those uh, fees uh, relative to interest, uh, excuse me, credit rating um, on the LPO website. There are no application fees. Uh, however, one thing that is very significant is that there are some transaction costs um, in the due diligence phase after you've gone through the full application process and your application has been accepted. Uh, the applicant is required to pay the external advisor fees uh, that DOE needs to hire. So DOE will hire independent financial advisor, independent engineer, legal counsel, and so forth. Uh, and the applicant is, is uh, required to cover those costs. Um, and those costs can run um, into the handful of millions of dollars. And it is that, it's for that reason that while there is no minimum uh, loan size, most of our loans are in the roughly 100 million and above range uh, for the simple reason that it's a lot easier to absorb that type of uh, fixed cost um, with the interest rate and still have a very cost effective uh, project financing project uh, at that scale. And uh, finally, there are some small uh, facility fees and maintenance fees that come along with the loans as well. Uh, some of the biggest questions that we get are, uh, how long does it take? It generally takes 12 to 18 months from where many of you are now to, uh, to funding of a loan. Uh, I would say that's very dependent on the, uh, the stage and preparedness of the project and the applicant, uh, the ability to provide uh, engineering reports, uh, EBC contracts, and, and so forth uh, at the appropriate time uh, to, keep it, uh, to keep it moving and on that timeline. Uh, costs we just, uh, we just reviewed, but again, uh, no application fees. Uh, but there are some third party uh, advisor costs to be aware of. Um, and uh, sizing, as I mentioned, our average loan is about a billion dollars. Our smallest are around a hundred million. But as I said, uh, that's just a, a guideline. Uh, there is no statutory lower limit. It's more of a practical lower limit based on the costs that are involved in, um, in receiving a loan. So uh, finally, uh, go to the website provided here uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit, but well, the three websites provided here uh, to get a little bit more information about our programs and their requirements. Uh, you can see uh, all of the application components to get an idea of what uh, is involved in filling out an application. Uh, and at the top here, uh, middle top of the page, you can go to energy.gov slash LPO slash pre -app. Uh, and you can schedule a pre-application consultation where one of our experts uh, will go with, to go through you with your project 
um, and help you assess whether LPO can be uh, an effective partner for, uh, for your plans. So uh, with that, uh, I'll draw my remarks to a close and uh, we can open it up to uh, any questions that any of y'all may have. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That was an excellent and very informative presentation. Uh, we've already got quite a few questions submitted, so we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. So on qualifications, would repurposing or retrofitted, retrofitting unused bioethanol fermentation assets to produce alternative protein ingredients or products qualify for loan guarantee support under um, the EIR 1706 program? Uh, probably not under 1706, but the technology itself, if it's in this sector and it's an innovative technology, could certainly qualify for a 1703 program, uh, likely in the innovative supply chain area. Great. A couple other questions on qualification. So many of the needs to move forward on incremental food production involve system integration from existing technology. So meaning the new commercial production facility is integrating multiple existing technologies at scale, uh, capable of serving commercial scale to the market. So would that qualify for an LPO loan? Yeah, the, we, I mean, of course it's, it's dependent on the specifics of what those technologies are, but we do see many applications where there's a new and novel approach where commercially available technologies are can be combined in such a way to create such a thing um, that is brand new in the marketplace. Uh, and I've seen many instances where uh, projects like that are, meet our eligibility requirements. Uh, I would also mention that this, this is also a place where if there's doubt about that, or perhaps it doesn't, um, we can always finance projects through our state energy financing institution pro, uh, program where if you receive support from a CEFI, uh, the innovation requirement is waived. Great. Thank you. Does the LPO try to fund a limited number of projects within each different process and product technology innovation category, or can an unlimited number of applicants per technology apply? So for example, would LPO be willing to provide loans or guarantees for more than one project using say precision fermentation technology to produce dairy proteins? Yeah, we absolutely can. Uh, we absolutely can and want to provide uh, as many uh, what, uh, project financing to as many innovative projects as we can. Um, we, uh, it, we don't pick any winners and losers in the category. We are uh, simply a resource to be able to catalyze prods, innovative technologies to reach commercial scale in the US. Great. Do you have a requirement regarding profitability of the company at the time of application? Uh, LPO does not have a profitability requirement. However, um, if, for example, the company does not have a history of operating profitably and they're applying for a very large loan uh, where the profitability, the cash flow of the company cannot back up uh, the loan that's being applied for, um, that gets reflected in the uh, equity requirements that would be that LPO would be looking for at the project level. So maybe one additional detail I'll, I'll mention is that what LPO typically does is, is provides project financing to a project entity, um, which is almost always uh, a company that then creates a project entity, which is the entity that builds the factory, for example. And it's a non-recourse loan to that entity. Um, and so either equity needs to be provided at that project level, or it needs to be guaranteed by the sponsor. Thank you. Are there limitations or benefits with respect to companies receiving federal and non-federal government funding? And are there benefits to receiving the non-federal government funding? Uh, yes. So this is, I briefly mentioned the federal support restriction. What that means is you can't get a grant from DOE or the federal government and an LPO on the same project. Uh, and that's for the very simple reason that you can't use the DOE's money to repay the DOE. Um, 
If, however, you have a pilot facility or demonstration facility that has received DOE funding, for example, through one of the other offices, and now you want to do a commercial deployment of that technology, that's totally okay, as long as they are separate projects. But you can't use federal support uh, to repay a federal loan on the same project. With respect to state financing uh, and local financing, there are generally not restrictions on that. And as I mentioned with our CEFI program, there can be great advantages there where we have the ability to take uh, smaller investments made by state energy financing institutions and multiply them uh, many fold. Thank you for clarifying. So food and beverage companies have, you know, fundamentally different offtakes compared to energy, um, generally purchase orders or maybe one year contract. So how does LPO think about commercial readiness metrics and food and beverage specifically? Uh, yes, well, you mentioned commercial readiness. So we think about that slightly different. I'll answer that question and talk a bit about offtakes. So commercial readiness in LPO world really means it's technical readiness level of the technology. Um, we generally look for TRL eight and above um, that relates to the technology itself. With respect to offtakes, uh, yes, offtake is important. Uh, and within this industry, I have my own experience here. I know that offtakes agreements are not generally done. So, but that's okay. Um, commercial risk, uh, LPO can take commercial risk. What the LPO underwriting teams would be looking for in that event is a track record or history of operating within the space um, and seeing what uh, the company has done in the past in uh, commercially. Uh, also, the equity ratio on the project is another way that a large amount of commercial risk can be mitigated. Um, and there are many other more specific strategies in the financial structuring that can be done um, that can help uh, LPO and a uh, project developer that does not have an offtake try to uh, get to a risk profile that um, LPO can underwrite. Um, and that's something that, you know, it's obviously very project specific, um, but something that our application specialists work, this is their job is to work with applicants um, to try to help uh, bridge the gap where there may not be, um, you know, guaranteed offtake or long-term uh, purchase contracts for alternative protein projects uh, and products. And how do you suggest alternative protein companies address requirements that apply less well to the industry, such as having prior experience with at least two renewable energy products or energy efficiency projects? Um, I'm sorry, where is that? It sounds like you're referencing something there. Is that uh, the, the prior experience? Yeah, what, um, what's the I, I don't about? know the basis of the question. If, if it's not clear, we can move on to the oh, next. Oh, okay, no, well, here, let me let me try to address it. Um, yeah, I mean, the loan programs oper office operates in DOE. Its uh, mandate has been expanded to include areas like steel and cement, like food and beverage, like chemicals that we don't traditionally think of as, you know, energy generation storage or, you know, transmission but are part of the larger mandate of decarbonizing the United States economy. Um, LPO is by far the largest program at DOE uh, for, de for doing that, for decarbonizing the economy. Um, I, I, without knowing the specific reference, I don't think that it's required that a company have previous experience with uh, those things per se, what we do look for, of course, is, is these are loans, right? And uh, underwriters are going to uh, need to have a reasonable prospect of repayment. And so they'll be looking at the management uh, of the team, the, uh, the management team, the history of the company, um, its capital stack and formation um, to understand what are the factors um, of risk that uh, we will underwrite in providing project finance to a loan. And, you know, by definition, we are very often providing uh, debt to sub investment grade uh, projects. Um, and that's really because that is uh, very much the purpose of LPO is to try to catalyze uh, technologies that are ready, 
but not yet commercially available so that they can get to uh, a future state where uh, they're securitizable, they're bankable, and so forth. Great, thank you. All right, so the next category of questions here is around the environmental review. So from your presentation, it sounds like you're open to evaluating either solely the manufacturing process or everything across the value chain required to produce an end product. Um, is that accurate first? Yeah, so generally speaking, I would think about the, so our team, our technical team, when you, when you submit the first part of our application, our technical team will do a full greenhouse gas assessment. Um, that is a cradle to grave assessment. Um, you provide the information for that assessment based on your project, all of the inputs, uh, and our team does that uh, assessment. There are two key elements of that assessment uh, to be aware of. Um, one is the uh, functional unit, and the other is the business as usual case. So the business as usual case is essentially, uh, what is your project making? And what is it replacing in the marketplace? If it's an alternative protein um, that is being provided to the marketplace, what other proteins is it displacing? And our team will do an analysis to figure out, okay, it's replacing X amount of steak and X amount of chicken and X amount of, you know, maybe other vegetarian tofu type project, uh, projects, as an example. Um, and then the, the functional unit will be, if you're making a burger, it'll be a burger, or if it is um, something further up in the supply chain, um, an ingredient, um, it'll be uh, a functional ingredient that is existing on, on the marketplace. So uh, those two things are the inputs uh, that will produce the greenhouse gas assessment that will determine whether or not a project is eligible for uh, LPO financing. Um, it's slightly different in a manufacturing project versus um, other projects, but uh, I don't think that's anything to worry about. The uh, greenhouse gas assessment is exactly the same in both of those scenarios. Great, thank you. And you got ahead of our very next question around the business as usual case. So thank you for addressing that. Yep. Um, are both B2C and B2B projects eligible? And if so, how does this approach differ for ingredients versus end products? Uh, both are eligible, and uh, the really the only difference between end products and ingredients would be uh, the factors of what that business, business as usual case is in terms of what your alternative protein is replacing. Um, and I, I can imagine scenarios where the commercial risk side uh, factors are quite a bit different um, if you're selling an end product to a consumer versus an ingredient in a B2B context. I've got um, a handful of questions around the process itself. So at what stage of project development do you advise companies to begin the application process? Yeah, generally speaking, you want to begin the process when your project is well formed enough that it's not going to materially change between when you start applying and when you uh, would receive financing. So our application process for Title 17 has two parts. Uh, the first part is an eligibility review, and it's just simply the greenhouse gas, and is the project in the US, and is it energy related, some of those initial things. And that's relatively lightweight. Uh, once you get through that process, you get a letter from Director Shaw that says your project is eligible for LPO financing. And then you go into all of the financial factors in the part two application, which is, Think of it as exactly the same as applying for project financing from a commercial lender. It is very, very similar to that process. The reason you want to start when you're relatively well formed is if, let's say, you have a facility that you want to build that's a hundred, a you know, hundred million dollar facility, and you go through part one and you get a letter that says it's eligible, and then uh, you're very successful in your uh, business and in your equity financing, and now you decide you want to build a $200 million facility. Well, you have to go back through the eligibility review uh, because the scope of your project has changed materially. Uh, and so it's better uh, from an efficiency of time and money perspective um, to try to get the project to a point where you kind of know it's not going to change in scope too much. Uh, and then you reach out uh, and we can get you going on the part one application. 
Thank you. So you touched on the part one and two there and, and a question asked that um, how the hours of the approximately 400 hours that companies can spend on an application um, might break down between uh, part one and part two versus due diligence phases. Yes. So uh, here I'll, I'll point you to the link on the very bottom of this page, our Title 17 Clean Energy Financing page. Um, if you go to that website, the very first link is our program guidance. Um, and uh, the, very, the second link are the application instructions for part one and part two. The easiest way to answer that question is to just look at the application instructions for part one and part two. I would say that probably three quarters or more of the time spent by the applicant will be in the part two application process. That is the reasonable prospect of repayment. Um, that is where um, maybe it's useful for me to mention, you know, if you're building a factory, uh, you're in order to finish part two, you're gonna need uh, EPC contracts, you're gonna need independent engineering reports, you're gonna need feed studies, um, you will need to be shovel ready for sure. Um, you can start part two without many of those things, but you won't finish part two without many of those things. And so uh, when I mentioned before that our process is about 12 to 18 months, depending on the readiness of the client, uh, most often where I see timelines slipping from that is where you get into part two and, well, the engineering and the facility isn't done. And we need to wait on that in order to uh, keep going forward with part two. So general guideline, lightweight part one heavyweight part two um, and timing very dependent on your readiness essentially uh, to build what you want to build um, one uh, of what you put through the part one process. Thank you. And then what is the expected cost for part one of the process? Uh, zero cost uh, other than your time. There's no application fee and those um, advisor fees come in the due diligence phase actually after the part two application. You mentioned that applicants must pay um, third-party advisory fees during the due diligence stage. So is there some sort of conditional commitment, draft term sheet, or other understanding of what companies are likely to get before they commit to paying those fees and undertaking the full due diligence? Um, essentially, no. So there, the draft term sheet uh, comes in the due diligence phase. Um, and uh, that's when advisor fees start to be, um, uh, be incurred. And the conditional commitment for a loan comes after the due diligence phase for LPO. Um, what I would say to try to reassure you is that after your part two loan application is accepted, uh, you have a very good idea that you're going to get a loan. Uh, and I, I believe it is true that we have had zero instances where a company has gotten to due diligence and not gotten a loan other than self-selecting out of the program themselves. That's helpful, thank you. So what level of information regarding the project is expected to be shared in the pre-application consultation session with LPO? Uh, you, I mean, you can have none, <laughs> um, but it's, it's probably not super useful to do a pre-application consultation at that stage. What I would say is you really wanna have a project. Um, it, it's helpful to have a location for that project, a size for that project, um, a scope for that project um, when you do a pre-application consultation because a lot of the questions that you'll start to get into in that phase will, will relate exactly to those things. You'll, you'll be asked about um, where you are in your project equity. You'll be asked about uh, what the commercial risk is and is there offtake or what's the plan for selling whatever the project will be producing uh, and factors like that. So, you know, if you, if you don't have a good idea on those things, it's probably best to wait until you do. Um, to engage and, and get going then. Great. Um, the question here stated, doesn't part one include requirements to have construction contracts, plans, et cetera, already? Uh, again, here I'd reference, uh, go look at the application instructions for part one. Um, what I would say is this, um, most successful applications at LPO 
start the part one process when they are pretty, when they are already down the track from an engineering standpoint. Um, I, that is something that I've seen. Um, and I have also observed that maintaining momentum between the part one and the part two process um, is generally in the interest of uh, getting the financing done and done more quickly. So um, all that is to say that uh, we do have a lot of projects that come to us with a lot of that work already done. Um, the specific requirements of what is needs to be evaluated in the part one application are, are in these application instructions. But the engineering that is required for part one is, relates to uh, being able to do the assessment of innovative technology and greenhouse gas uh, impact um, rather than uh, evaluate the financial viability. So that's where the, the distinction lies between what's needed in part one and part two. Thank you. All right, we have a series of questions on the loans themselves. So do the LPO loans require personal guarantees? No. Great. Is the $100 million minimum loan size guideline referring just to LPO share of the project um, or to the total overall project cost? Yeah, what I would say is, again, this is not a statutory limit. It is a, it is a practical limit. So um, the way I would think about it is plan on two to $5 million in closing costs for those advisors. Um, look at a, an interest rate of US treasuries plus three eighths plus a small risk-based charge. And then think, what size of loan do I need to have for that to make financial sense in my, my capital formation? Obviously a $20 million loan, if you're gonna pay $5 million in closing costs becomes a very expensive loan. Um, but that's really up to you. Uh, in terms of where that limit lies relative to other financing options you either have or don't have available to you. So I would just try to think about it in that uh, normal context. Um, generally speaking, when I'm saying our average loan is a billion and our smallest is around 100 million, that is the loan we provide. So, um, so the projects are another you know, 30 to 50% larger than those numbers on an average project size basis. Thank you. What are the default rates on loans and are there challenges in measuring risk that applicants should be aware of? Um, I, I don't actually have a ton of information on defaults. Um, we do publish that information as a part of our monthly activity reports on our DOE website. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that um, the default rates have been much less than what um, we've traditionally targeted for default rates. Um, obviously, we are uh, in the business of providing loans to riskier projects, and, and that's uh, where our risk appetite lies. Um, maybe help me, uh, Caroline, with the risk question in terms of measuring risk. Um, do you have any It context? was, specifically around challenges in measuring risk. Yeah, I'm not sure the context of the question. What I would say is that our underwriting team, um, are they're going to look at, the biggest things that they're going to look at are um, a construction risk. Uh, they're going to look at feedstock risk. Um, they're obviously going to look at technology risk, but we generally don't fund projects that, well, we, we don't fund projects that are at pilot or, or demonstration scale. So there should be some sort of demonstrated abil ability of this technology that it works. Uh, and then the commercial side, which would be uh, risk on the, on the sell side of whatever's being made. So those are the three biggest areas that risk gets quantified by our underwriters. Clarification, sir. Thank you. All right, we have just a handful of remaining questions I think we can get through before we end at 15 after the hour. So, um, Geographically, must the applicant or parent company be a U.S. domiciled business? No, no. The project has to be in the U.S. Um, you will be required to disclose confidentially to LPO um, basically your whole cap stack, uh, your, your cap table and all uh, significant owners. Um, but there is not a restriction on the company or the owners being U.S. based. Great. Nor citizens. That's correct. Okay. Um, 
And does being commercially available make you unable to get a loan? <clears throat> uh, yes, unless, uh, well, let me define commercially available. So the way that LPO defines commercially available is no more than three deployments uh, in the United States for more than five years. Um, so there are instances where a project is commercially, or excuse me, a technology is commercially available in Europe or some other part of the world, but not yet in the US. And we can absolutely finance those projects. But if there are three commercial deployments for more than five years of that same technology here in the US, then it would not be eligible um, for, um, for LPO financing. Okay. I will read just the, the rest of this question to make sure it's clear for the, the yep. asker. Um, so assuming I, I would imagine then if it was, you know, under that five-year threshold, if the loan will help the product get lower on the cost curve. So they might be selling, say, currently today at a very low margin, but have a scale-up plan to reduce costs. Would that be fundable under that five-year mark, potentially? If there are less than three commercial deployments of that same technology in the United States for less than five years, then yes. yes. Um, if there are, uh, I should also just me I briefly mention in my presentation our CEFI and EIR programs. Both of those programs remove the innovation requirement. So um, you know, typically we're not funding things that are commercially available like a regular solar farm, but uh, that, that's obviously an energy example. But if you get CEFI financing or you build it on an old coal plant, you can get an LPO loan without innovation or with a technology that is already commercially available um, if you uh, go through one of those two paths. Thank you. And can you clarify what a deployment is in the context of alternative protein production? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I would think about it as a commercial facility, a large commercial facility. Um, it's something that is going to, it, it's, it's not a pilot plant to demonstrate that the technology works or a demo plant to, under, to, to show that the technology works. It is something that is going to go into the broad market, whatever that is, uh, B2B in an ingredient sense, B2C if it happens to be that. Great. And is there a list somewhere of all qualifying CEFI institutions? Um, I believe that that is yet to be put up on our website, but will be any day. Okay. Yeah. How many companies in this industry are in the process of applying, if you're able to say, and how large are most companies applying in other industries right now? Yeah, the first question, unfortunately, I can't uh, comment on because all of our conversations with companies are confidential. Um, and the range of companies that applies for financing at LPO is wide. So we have uh, companies that have that are some of the largest companies on the planet that have been in, the, you know, for example, the oil and gas industry for a long time and are now building um, renewable assets. Uh, and we also have uh, companies that are relatively new within, you know, companies founded in the last five years that are building um, new innovative approaches to energy that, you know, haven't been done before. Uh, but they have uh, the management teams, capital structures and so forth, uh, where they can qualify for our financing. So it runs again. Are there hard and fast rules about what is, quote, commercial scale, especially for new tech like cultivated meat? Uh, no. <laughs> no, okay. I mean, I think I think you're going to be limited by what's in it, what's in it, uh, a cost effective loan through LPO. Right. I mean, you need to get to some scale before it makes financial sense, um, as we discussed. But I think that's probably your size limiter more than anything. Okay. Well, uh, perfect timing there because we have gotten through all of the questions. So um, thank you to everyone who joined us today for um, your engagement. Lots of great questions here. Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us um, and share this information. Um, as I said at the beginning, we will send a recording to everyone. I know some folks had a hard time hearing Director Shaw, so that um, video will also be shared with you so you can catch up on that. 
Um, and uh, I think that's it for today. So thank you.